I'm Joanna Garzilli. You're watching Life Stories. Today, my guest is Mike Cernovich, filmmaker, author, and journalist. Mike, welcome to Life Stories. My pleasure, thank you for having me. So I'm gonna dive right in. We're gonna start at childhood. Between four and six years old, what is the most impactful memory that comes to mind? Impactful memory is hard because I don't know that I have a formative memory from that age. I do remember being in kindergarten and sitting on this big mat that had the ABCDs on it and all the kids would sit on a different letter. But otherwise, I What letter did you sit on? I don't know. Yeah, I don't have much of a memory before first grade. Then I, then I have a, a memory. So childhood memories before I would say six years old, not much stands out. So kindergarten, right? That's when you're first, mm -hmm. when you really started to have a sense. What was the primary feeling that you had on a day-to-day -day basis at that point? I, I would say I always felt a little bit isolated, a little bit, a, a sense of disconnection probably. There, there's, when you hear people talk about, and, and I learned now it was introversion versus extroversion, but I just had a sense of I didn't necessarily belong and I didn't dislike people. People didn't dislike me, but I didn't feel, um, I'll give you an example. When I was in the first grade during a break, the teacher would, we had records back then, and she would play music and the kids would all get up and dance. And I just sat there and thought, why are people dancing? This doesn't make any sense to me. It seemed weird. So. I just very often felt that other people were very strange and unlike me. At what point in your childhood did you feel peaceful? Or did you feel that you belonged? I don't, never. No, I, I didn't have a particularly nice childhood. I didn't have a particularly enjoyable childhood. And I always felt a sense of these other people are just strange to me. They, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, well, what, alienation or something. What's the worst thing that happened to you in your childhood that you turned into a positive experience in your life today? Well, I, over, I definitely I had a, a number of things in my childhood where I was the fat kid kind of growing up. It's like a proverbial thing. So I got picked on and bullied for that. And then my family was quite poor. And my mom had bipolar. So she would sometimes be in various states of mania at the time. It used to be called manic depressive or she would be in a state of depression. And uh, so it was always very weird as a child. You said your mom had uh, a, a mania there. At that time in your life, like, how did you process that? How did you get through that? Well, I, I hated being a child. Um, probably a lot of people look back to their childhood with nostalgia, and I didn't like it. I had no power, no control over my own life. No, I, I had a sense that we were poor. I knew we were poor, but there was nothing I could do about it. So I was, at a very young age, had a, a sense of, like, we were poor in a way I think that other kids maybe wouldn't have had, and realized there was nothing that I could do about it. So most of my childhood was spent with a profound sense of we're in a kind of bad place and there's nothing really that I can do about it. At what point did you start to, when you said the word power, did you start to realize that you had control over your circumstances and to feel good? Well, that, that hit me definitely. There, there were a number of, of arcs. One was when I, start, so I was picked on all the time. It was you know, pretty bad. And then I started training martial arts, and I wasn't very good at first. What sort of martial arts were you doing? I did uh, Taekwondo and boxing, and I wasn't very good. But then I, it, it takes a while, right? First year, you don't really notice anything. And then I got pretty good and fought back pretty hard. And then you, you started to see that there is a process to this. Okay, you apply yourself, you work hard, you can overcome adversity through that way, through, through putting work in and finding a method and system that worked. So finding that system that worked, where did that lead you to? Well, it always led me to a sense of, so I was a bookish 
so there was always a sense of, well, I'll just go to the library and read a book. I'll just figure it out. And I noticed a lot of people, they don't, especially because I do um, mindset work and other things, people just ask me really dumb questions. And there's no more polite way to say it where I just think, why Give would an you... an example of a dumb question. <laughs> like how to start a blog, right? You can go onto Google, how do I start a blog? And you can find 10,000 different answers. And the idea that you would ask me, how would I start a blog? It's such a lazy, maybe dumb is the wrong word. It's just such a lazy question. And I learned that if I wanted information, I could find the information. If I applied the information, generally speaking, the information would work. So then you learn how to curate good, accurate information that's reality-based. And you learn you have to apply the information to your life. And that was sort of the story of the rest of my life. What was an impactful book for you all those years ago that still sticks with you in all that you're doing? Well, as a kid, I just read a book, Better Boxing for Boys. It was some little you know, thin book or something in the library. And there's quite a lot into throwing a punch. A proper Most people cannot throw a proper punch. They punch from the arm. And though there's actually a technique to it. And for me, once you, when you learn how to throw a punch, uh, most people have never been hit really hard in the face by a proper punch. People, you get hit arm punch or some kind of shove. And there's an expression on a person's face where like a man will try to start a fight with you. And you can tell, okay, this person has never been hit in the face before. And I remember I was, and I would say fifth grade maybe, and I was just getting hassled by some bully. This is the public school. You just get hassled. And there was no reason. I was quite shy, kept to myself. I wasn't provocative or anything like that. And this kid was just like hassling me. He was like a bigger kid. And he got into my face and I remember my leg just started shaking. So I just went and blasted him in the face and he fell down and his whole face was red. And he started crying. And he was for the grade school, like the toughest kid in the grade school or something like that. And I, he just, he had just blasted him. And there was just a sense of you just have to punch people back because I would done, I'd done nothing wrong. And there are things that have happened to me in a, my life where I could understand, yeah, I can get why people wouldn't like me. But you're just a kid and your number comes up and you realize you just, you punch someone in the face before. They've never been hit like that. And the whole reality changed and people left me alone for the rest of the school year. And obviously this is when in life one is being provoked, right? So, so, it, it, that for you is something that when someone comes at you? Yeah, the hassle, just hassling a person for no good reason. There's oftentimes a good reason to provoke a person because we're all flawed and, you know, we do things wrong and if people are sort of criticizing something you've done, that's part of the human condition. But you're just I was just a kid minding my own business and bigger kids would bully me. And it, it never made any sense to me. What would you say to someone that says, oh, well, going and hitting someone, a, a punch, whether it's physical or metaphorical, is not the answer. It needs to only be nonviolence. What would you? I wish. Yeah, that's I wish. I absolutely wish that as a kid, I didn't have to get into fights with people. This is not a fun thing when you're a child having to watch your back, because if you punch someone back, it, it's never like over. You, know, you watch the movies and people get in a fight and then everything's good. No, then that kid's got two other kids and his friends come in or maybe three jump you. And it's, an, it's a never ending cycle of violence. So I wish that it weren't the case that sometimes you had to, to punch people. But it's just a simple reality. They hassled me. They weren't going to stop hassling me. And they didn't hassle me anymore after that. How has that theme continued in your life where where you are today. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, 100%. If people come after me metaphorically, they aren't prepared for anyone to to fight them back metaphorically because I don't need to use violence, but I can use my words in a very powerful and impactful manner. And people try to say that I would bully them and I would go, wait, 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 you missed the whole part where they went after my child. Like, for example, there are people who say, oh, that Cernovich went after me for blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, no, you left out the part where you made photoshopped images of my daughter and, and put her in literally in sexual positions. And people do something like that. And, oh, you know, it's funny. We're getting on our skin. It's like, no, no, no. You have no idea. You have no idea what's going to come next for you. And that, yeah, that is a theme that I learned is that I 
w wish it were the case that people could be civil, disagree, everything would be cool. Uh, I don't like violence. I oppose violence. I disavow especially political violence unprovoked. But if a person is attacking you, well, then... Well, talk to me about your, your mission. Um, and your mission, what I hear from you is, you're a, you're a fighter, mm -hmm. right? So, and not in the negative sense. Right. So what, 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 do you, what are you fighting for in your, in your mission, in your life purpose? That, that's, I've never thought of that question before, but you, you are right. The theme would be that when there's something in your face, you have to fight back against it. And I would say now my mission is primarily fam my family-based. And businesses and talk to me things. a little bit about how you met your wife. It, we met the the last place to meet um, a person, which is at a bar. I always tell people you should never meet someone at a bar. And then how'd you meet your wife? I met her at a bar. How'd you meet her? I said you're going the wrong way. You need to be over here. Just some you know cheesy line that worked. And that's the worst place, the worst advice to ever give someone though. Don't go meet people at bars. I like I know all these wonderful women who are single. And they go to bars and I go, what are you doing at bars? They go, well, you met, you know, Shauna there. I go, that was a lottery ticket. The probabilities of that are low. Don't do that. Do you ever fight in your marriage? No, we have a, this is, uh, I learned from my first one. So this is, you, you learn to going forward, be your true authentic self. And then you fight a lot less, but people are afraid to be the authentic self because you might be rejected. But Chris, Chris Rock had a comedy routine where he said, when you're on a date, you're not dating a person. You're dating that person's agent, right? Here's me. And what do you kind of want to hear? I want to tell you what you want to hear because I don't want to face rejection. And, and we all fear rejection. Of course, it's absurd to say we're not. But you realize that you're going to be rejected early or later because your, your authentic self is eventually going to come out. And then that's what leads to the friction of fighting. So and, and right from the beginning, it just took a radical honesty approach to the relationship. And what I wanted, and part of it's knowing what you wanted to, but just this is the way that I anticipate living my life. And if you like it, cool. If not, that's cool too. How did your documentary hoaxed come about? There was, I'd made a film about free speech in 2015, and I felt like, I'd always wanted to make a film, right? A great film. And I felt like I left something on the field, right? It just, the, the production level wasn't where it was. We had a, a great guest, a very diverse cast of people, and it just didn't come out the way it should have, though. It didn't feel like a real film. It felt like a YouTube documentary or something. And I said, I want to do, I'm going to do a film where, I just laid on the line, but I wanted to not do a partisan film. I wanted to do a film where I talked to a lot of people. So, for example, we talked to right-wing people, but we also talked to Black Lives Matter and quite fairly let him present, because I believe in letting a person present the strongest version of their argument, even if I don't agree with it. So I said, okay, what's your strongest argument here? And then, and then people can watch it and get a multiple points of views and realize that well, in the case of you know, Black Lives Matter, a lot of times people say, oh, they're rioting. Or they'll say, well, why don't, why don't black people march when there's gun violence? It's like, no, but they do. You can just, the images aren't promoted by the media, though, because the media wants to see that, the fires, or the real, when things go really wild. But, and then people think, well, they're, therefore, they're not doing anything peaceful. We're like, no, 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 that's 99% of what they do is. And in a way, the, the people think fake news is a left right wing thing, but there are many civil rights groups that are themselves victims of fake news because they don't get when they're doing the right things, doing good things, and they're positive. Press doesn't want to cover that because people don't want positive. You specialize in mindset. What do you feel is a core quality value that we as humanity could integrate to be able to make this world a better place? The number one is resourcefulness, a belief that if you keep looking, you'll find the answer. Because that resourcefulness is embedded with optimism, hope, vision. Okay, what's going on? Like, what's the problem? Because most people have a fatalistic attitude, mindset. Oh, I got broke up. I'll never meet anybody. Or, oh, I lost my job. That's it. I'm going to go bankrupt and be destitute and be living on the streets or something. 
And the answer to that is just, okay, calm down. <laughs> we'll figure it out. And I, I've always had this sense, and that probably is because in the childhood that sort of mindset was rewarded, is if you just patiently apply yourself, you look for the right answers, you apply the answers, then you're not going to get out of the, the hole in a day or a week, maybe even it'll take you a few years, but you will succeed in whatever area you want to succeed. But it might be 10 years. Do you use a lot of visualization as well? Yeah, you have to drill the conversations in your head. There's a sense where when I, whenever I interview or do some kind of media thing or do something, I'm always prepared because in my mind I'm always running questions through or attack vectors through or what if what if that says that or what if the person says that or what if this happens and in my mind I'm always drilling potential situations and wargaming things out and making the decision trees and mind maps. What percentage of space do you allow then for something to come through you that you didn't plan for? Well once you hit flow state that's where you achieve artistry. Most people want to be artists the first day of art class. And they say, I'm too good to draw this figure. I'm too good to do this. I'm too good to do it this certain way. But mastery comes from the basics. And then once you have the basics down, you're not self-referential. Most people their whole time, oh, what if they're, they're in the wrapped up in their head because they haven't prepared. So if you're, if you're worried about, oh, I have to get down to this lower level here, then you're never going to rise to the super high levels or have that magic, the je ne sais quoi, that X factor that comes out because you're not drilling, you're not drilling the basics. You're not strumming the guitar just regularly. What is the number one basic that we could all implement to manifest dreams, goals, mission? Well, what the physiological, mental, recognize that the processes are one and the same. Everybody should focus more on their breathing. I do the Wim Hof breathing course and the cold water training and quite regimented and the sets and the rounds and everything like that because if you control your breathing, you're never going to be stressed out. People understand. You can always tell when someone has nervous energy and then their thought, it's a, it's a cascade, it's a cycle where, oh, my, my, my thoughts are running out of control and I'm breathing hard and my, my shallow breathing, I'm not getting enough oxygen in my brain and then they're just not present, they're, they're not grounded. And the number one skill people could learn is just take the Wim Hof breathing course or watch the videos and do, do the exercises. And because that's one of the, most of our physiology we can't control. So for example, if my heart's going to thump, 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 I can't say, hey, heart, slow down, right? Maybe at a deep yogi or something, right? But I can't just say, slow down, heart. And if you feel an adrenaline spike, I can't just say, adrenaline, go away. Cortisol, go away. Oh my God, I'm amped up. But I can say, oh, am I breathing through my diaphragm? Am I breathing into my stomach all the way in the bottom, fully oxygenating, my, oxygenating myself? That's one of the only physiological... Now, you can't stop breathing. You know, the, there's to it, but that's the only parasympathetic response that we can control. And then you find out once you control your breathing, you control everything else. Because if your breathing is... If your heart rate's going too fast, and then you breathe quickly too, then your heart rate's gonna increase. But if your heart rate's breathing too fast, then you control your breathing, you bring it down, then you become calm, and then your heart is gonna slow down too. Talk to me about legacy that you're creating. Obviously, you've had a massive impact already in the world. Some would see that as very positive, some would see it as very negative. What for you, what are you creating and why? Well, right now, and, and, and you make a great point, which is positive and negative. I've, I was less conscious of my energy and how I was creating negative energy in the world. And just by being mean to people or talking to people in a certain way or maybe making fun of people in a way that just wasn't mature. And not only not mature, but not valuable towards the conversation. And lately I've been focused on unity for people who want it because when i look around there and it's not political it's both sides the people are losing their minds i can't believe when i watch things they're they really they're hyperventilating and they're stressing out and there was even a, a recent poll from gallup which said that americans are the most stressed out for as long as they've ever done it 
but the times have never been better by objective measures. And I'm interested in having conversations with people who want to sit down like adults and not scream at each other and yell at each other. There's, there's enough people doing that. Yes, yeah, so then with the political arena, there seems to be a lot of screaming and shouting at each other. Yeah, and that's why I do much less you know, socio-political, or even this, this is a hoax is a very positive, pro-human film, which says, hey, we're being manipulated to feel this way. We're being manipulated to be angry. We're being manipulated to, to hate each other. So, you know, you're putting this message out there, and yet does one need time away from social media, away from hearing outside news? What, how do you feel about that? I, for most people, social media is clearly a net negative, and it's something that should be controlled or viewed as a, it should be viewed as alcohol, is the way I view social media. You come home, you have a little scotch or a mojito or something, a little wine, that's fine. But if you're getting drunk and you're just becoming a, a part of your life and it's hindering your life, then it's a problem. And I'll give you an example for about social media, even though it's not political, but just to tie it together is I'm 41. And when I was 18, I didn't know any girl who wanted to get plastic surgery because nobody knew what plastic surgery was. And because I have kind of a broader audience, you know, I have a young, you know, some younger fans and everything. I'll see girls 19 years old talking about um, fillers and stuff. And it's like, no, no, no. Fillers are what you do when you, you know, you get a little older and your, your cheeks sucked in or something. It's not something 19 year olds should even be thinking about. And these girls, I mean, I guess the women, 19, 20, whatever, they're obsessed with every little nitpicky thing. Oh, this is, and they're quite attractive too, which is bothersome. And, that's because if you're on social media, you're only seeing an idealized version of 0.00001%. And then you're being manipulated too, of course, by the advertising agencies and people who make these kind of products, whether you know it or not, to, to now you're wanting fillers because now you're a consumer. Now. And, and by the way, I'm pro and, and the irony here is I'm pro-plastic surgery, but not pro completely modifying your body when you're 19 years old. How, right. Right. So it's when people, you have a certain point of view and then people take it out of context, which is what you were speaking of earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Where I'm, or people, people struggle with like nuance or struggle with how I can be, I simultaneously say I'm pro plastic surgery, but you people are losing your minds about the plastic surgery in the sense of, you know, if they're, the world does treat you better if you're better looking. This is unfortunate, but, it, but it's true. So taking care of yourself, sure, is good. If there's a facial feature that maybe is really holding you back or really bothers you and you'll feel better about yourself and more confident, great. I know so many people have had no jobs and they feel so much better about themselves, great. But when it comes to the point of, I'm gonna nitpick now and I'm gonna find one little speck here, or one little thing here, and then that's all they focus on that becomes a depressive spiral because they're focusing on a perceived imperfection. And then they define themselves based on what they focus on. And now they think, oh, I'm imperfect, I'm flawed. Or, and, and, many, and then they sit around for hours a day thinking about all the plastic surgery they need. Who are three people that are the wind beneath your wings? I would say my daughters, um, for sure. That's a safe answer, but it happens to be, happens to be true. My, I have a daughter who's four months and, you know, she's cool and all, but... It's different when they're a couple of years old. And my older daughter is two and a half years old now, and she definitely. What are your daughter's names? Rumi and Syra. Rumi's the youngest, and Syra's definitely like my road dog. We hang out, we goof off, and everything like that. So I certainly, she certainly inspires me more than than any other person in life for sure. My wife's great, and everything like we have a. Like when I see the relationships, people, so I know uh, there's two layers. One is I know objectively we have a great relationship, but when I see the kind of stuff other people just the nitpicking and the there's a vibe where you sit down for dinner and you can just tell both people are on edge and the the passive aggressiveness on both sides. We don't have any of that, so it's, it's a great relationship. But she would know, my wife would know that my daughter is just everything to me. So your wife and daughters, you would say, are those three people? Yeah, I'll give them all three. I don't, I don't know that there's any other person that 
would necessarily lift me up. When I was younger, I was definitely a huge fan of young, the young Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he was, say, 27. The older Arnold, he just got a little safe. He he's wanted to be liked, I think, a little bit too much. And it, his message changed, and he went from very much go out, live your life, be be strong, make it happen, to trying to avoid all these trip wires that any public figure would have. So he's gotten boring. So that leads me to my last question. What do you want to be remembered for if you're going to be really true to the message and go all out? Yeah, I've always told people my book on mindset, Gorilla Mindset, is the most honest book that I've written. Because half the time I'm doing satire, like meta commentary, or there's tongue in cheek. And the most authentic expression of myself is definitely Gorilla Mindset. And that's been, you know, all over the world. And I've, I, I wanted to write a book that somebody would find 20 years from now. And I wrote that book, and that's my legacy work. Which is almost depressing because you're, you're Makes one. me think of Terminator, right? Yeah. Like John yeah. Connor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've written that book for. Exactly, yeah. the time traveling. Yeah. Very good. I'm Joanna Garzilli. You're watching Life Stories. Today, my guest was Mike Cernovich, filmmaker, author, journalist. You can watch episodes at lifestoriestelevision.com and also at Evertalk TV. Thank you so much for watching. Tune in next time.